I can't think of two better people to be talking about the, this new era of the human workforce than the two of you. Frida, you created a company that uses AI in recruiting. You've most recently created Aletheia, where you're pushing for transparency in technology, including HR tech. You in Multiverse uses AI and technology to match future generations of leadership with professional apprenticeships at a thousand businesses across the region. Before we begin this conversation, though, I have two asks of our audience. One, scan that beautiful badge of yours, send in some questions so that we can keep this conversation lively. And two, answer our polling question, which is probably the question that's been weighing on your mind ever since you walked through those doors today. Will AI eliminate mm -hmm. more jobs than it creates? Will AI eliminate more jobs than it creates? We're not gonna show you the answer now, we're gonna leave it till the end, so you're forced to listen to everything we say, and we'll pose it to Frida and Ewan at the end as well before, we, before the great reveal. Um, let's start the conversation. Let's get right to the elephant in the room, which is AI is this technology that has been heralded as a breakthrough that could eliminate entire professions, but also create whole new ones. Ewan, how has that transformed your job, your company, and how is that going to change the overall labor market? So I, I think the interesting thing when you look at companies and how they approach this area is every business feels like they are to an extent behind the curve, right? And that they're trying to play catch up. And that's for a couple of reasons. It's partly because companies have long been underweight skills in areas that are adjacent or fuel AI, like data, like LLMs, various other things. They'd spent, you know, we work with a lot of companies that spend billions on software, but actually comparatively little on skills and ensuring they have the, the right skills in their organization to adapt. And so that's created a huge need that exists in the market where people are saying, we have genuine capability gaps in an area that we know is incredibly important. <laughs> Many businesses feel that their peers are further ahead of them because they're all sort of, this sense of playing catch up is affecting them as they look around the market. Um, they're finding it very hard to attract or even meet ready-made talent because it doesn't really exist in the AI space outside of um, very small pockets. And so it creates incredible opportunities for businesses who engage with it, but it basically has meant that we deliver apprenticeships, right? So we are basically saying, if you are lacking for skills or talent, we can use these professional apprenticeship programs to give them. And we're doing that very directly in AI. We made an early decision to introduce an AI module into every single apprenticeship we deliver because it's that important. It's effectively become a functional skill, right? You, you will be able to, you will struggle to do your job well unless you have some form of capability in AI. And so that, that was the kind of primary piece for us. Make sure we get this into every single program we offer, and crucially then <laughs> use that to make AI more inclusive, because historically the niche it's existed in has not been tremendously inclusive. Frida, same question for yeah. you, uh, but also like I, I want you to tell me a little bit more, give us more flavor about yeah. like how it's changed it and the guard, guardrails that are necessary. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think, look, you know, there's lots of competing data sources in terms of, you know, it, job creation, job loss, et cetera. I think one of the things we can't uh, ignore is that in developing, in developed countries, we have a, an aging population and, uh, you know, Lauren Weber of the Wall Street Journal had this great piece where she basically described that, you know, over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see increasing worker shortages in developed countries. And we already see that. When I started Pemetrics in 2013 to when 2022, when I sold it, you know, we went from hundreds of applicants to people saying, look, if they're breathing, we're gonna hire them because we don't, we can't hire enough people. Um, and I think that what the, the, the gap is, is what Ewan is referring to, there are projected to be 3 million job losses by 2030 in professions like call centers, back office. There's projected to be 18 million job vacancies in computer-related fields, in healthcare and engineering. So the critical element, if we don't want workers to fall behind, and again, especially if it's gonna disproportionately affect women and minorities as has been projected, we need to ensure that platforms like Multiverse and others uh, you know, really are there to help the transition occur. And it's not just, I think, 
you know, technology companies that need to do that. It's employers that need to do that. It's governments that need to set up these programs. It's private public partnerships. Um, so again, I'm a big believer that we actually will not have enough people, but the problem is we need to make sure that the people we have have the skills required for the job. I mean, you, you, brought, you brought up the bias, and, and yep. you and I'm I want to yep. talk a little bit about that, right? Because you're using AI. You're not just applying it to the programs and helping people upskill in that. You're also applying it to the matches. How are you preventing bias and discrimination yep. from mm -hmm. entering your algorithms and influencing the matches you're making? So the first thing to say is it is something every company has to be incredibly intentional about from the very start because, as you say, if you automate an outdated or unfair process, you are not really solving anything beyond making unfairness even more embedded in whatever it is you've built. So that is, that is a problem and everyone has to address that directly. Um, we look very clearly at things that are actually correlative to job performance mm -hmm. and are not in academics, there's no correlation between academics and job performance. And you know, academic institutions have long struggled with this because of the ways they've assessed and graded people. And so we look at competency in particular, we look at intent, motivation, and potential and desire to learn and other things that are far more inclusive. And we, if you look across our apprentices, over half of the apprentices we place are people of color, over half are women, about 38% come from the most economically underserved communities. So we've done a good job of finding the remarkable but overlooked talent, not from typical sources. The key is then, as you build an algorithm around that, making sure that you don't start to see perverse drivers and, and, and sort of moves in directions you don't want to see, but also crucially that you have very clear human guardrails, right? It is not enough simply to automate in the short term as you are perfecting, you need many humans still evaluating, keeping eyes on that and assessing, are we doing this fairly and effectively? And the good thing is there's not a trade-off between fairness and efficacy, yep. right? Fairness provides more effective outcomes, better businesses, speak to any employer or CEO in the world and they will tell you, we want the best. It's just incumbent on all of us to challenge how we define yep, the best. For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, going back to guardrails, so um, Pymetrics was involved uh, in a law that was passed in New York, sort of first in the nation to put guardrails around automation and hiring. And it asks essentially companies to disclose uh, whether they have, uh, you know, basically levels of bias uh, regarding gender and race, right? And really, I think those types of guardrails are necessary as we begin to scale all types of technology, everything from, you know, sort of garden variety AI to, uh, you know, the fancy schmancy generative kinds. But at the end of the day, I think if we don't have information about the kind of data that goes into the models, what people are doing with the models, you know, just general transparency about output of bias, whether there is or is not, I think we're going to be basically creating more distrust in the public, which already exists. And, you know, with all the, you know, sort of advent of generative AI, we're starting to focus on, you know, existential risks of AI, et cetera, which, by the way, I completely think we should be focusing on, but we cannot ignore the real risks of AI that are currently affecting people, such as discrimination and bias. And I will want one point, which is newer companies, say, that had been started in the last five years, have really been at the forefront of complying with this New York City law. So companies like Eightfold, Hacker Rank, Phenom, Hired Score, as opposed to, I think, the older players that are less comfortable with the idea of necessarily having to disclose these types of pieces of information. So I really think that you know, this newer crop of technology companies, Multiverse obviously being one of them, I think is really poised to take advantage of um, the types of guardrails and the type of environment that we need to be building this technology in. Uh, y you mentioned the, the fears of existential yeah. threat, and yeah. <laughs> Jared over at Anthropic was up on this stage yeah. not too long ago, earlier this morning, yeah. talking about how we can't even 100% control the AI models we have in service now, and they're advancing exponentially. So where are we going to be in like a few years time? Right. And then there's the other camp that says, you know, that's a bunch of bull and, you know, is skeptical of yeah. it. I want to know where both well, of you stand in those camps. And so, I mean, we, I just got back from the World Economic Forum uh, meeting, annual meeting in Dubai. And, you know, so let's just be clear, the types of models that are, so definitely there's debate even within sort of the elite of AI as to whether there is existential risk or not. I think most people are sort of on the, on the, uh, of the mindset, of, you know, even if it's a 5% chance, we should pay attention, obviously. And they're sort of thinking about this as a weapon, right? 
But the types of companies, or we're talking about like very few tech companies and governments that actually have the capability to create these existential risk models of AI, nobody at company X, like, I don't know, Nestle or Procter & Gamble is running these. We have to differentiate between these sort of weapon-grade system AI you know, models that we absolutely need to be concerned about and we should do something about them, and sort of more pedestrian types of AI, which is what all of us are running, because it doesn't require supercompute and <laughs> NVIDIA chips, um, and really be concerned about what guardrails do we need for those. So it's really just two different sets, and I think we should pay attention to both. We shouldn't let the fancy stuff distract us from you know, what is also problematic here and now. So both can be true. You and yeah. where do you stand? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I, I agree. You laughed a little bit, so I, I'm... <laughs> I just, I, so I agree we shouldn't be complacent about it. Never underestimate humans' capacity for self-preservation. I mean, I, I don't think we're about to have machines sort of come and, and rule the world with an iron fist and everything else. But look, <laughs> there, are, there are much smarter people than I who are opining on that all yep. the time. Um, I, I do think, though, that if, you know... It's so important there is a global agreement on shared values and ethics and practice around AI that really does incorporate all the major players because there are certain countries and regions where they will have a less judicious approach to what is in scope and allowable and admissible versus what isn't that could catch up with us. And, and to your point, you know, if, uh, talking about human capacity for self-preservation, human capacity to weaponize anything is also very real. Yep. And so um, we do have to address that. I think the immediate threats, though, are less dramatic but more pernicious, mm -hmm. which are ingraining bias. Yep. And as I say, re you know, getting to flawed outcomes more efficiently and faster simply because we haven't looked at the underlying principles upon which AI is being built. Correct. Yeah. Ewan, let's stay with you for a second because we had Michelle Donnellan on a little earlier. There was talk about the UK uh, AI summit. You may or may not have ties to the political world. I don't know. I don't know what your connections are. But uh, I'm, I'm interested in hearing, because you're here, you know, you live in London, what do you think will come out of that UK AI summit, if anything? So I, I hope something does come out, because it's actually, and it's, it's a big thing and a big signal mm -hmm. for the UK yep. that we're able to have that here and show that, yep. you know, post-Brexit, plenty of questions have been asked as to whether Britain can still play a significant role on the world stage. Yep. That is a great thing to see. Mm -hmm. I hope we get, as I say, shared understanding and conventions around how countries will operate, what they will share, what things we will and won't do, because one of the advantages of bringing the heads of state in some of the biggest countries in the world together around is that they can come up with a shared set of principles. Yeah. And there are no quick and easy ways to do that without general agreement. And it is something that needs to, you know, will cover multiple different types of government and country and other things. Um, I'm excited about it. I think it's a big yeah. thing for Britain, as I said to you. Yeah. Uh, I, we, we're running out of time here already. I can't believe it. And I want to get to some of the questions that are being sent in here. Frida, this may be a good one for you. Beyond the economic question of human capital, someone wants to know, ro what role, if any, do you think AI should play in well-being and mental health? Uh, I think it's a dual-edged sword. I think AI has humongous potential for you know, all sorts of healthcare applications, right, that we're just beginning to unlock. I mean, again, at this World Economic Forum Council, we were talking about how you know, protein structure, which would take 10 years of an academic's life to figure out, AI can now do in a second. So we literally have you know, researchers at all these universities uh, now thinking, hmm, what should I do with my <laughs> academic career? And that's not just in protein folding, it's in all forms of mental health, right? The flip side, I think, is just that I think, you know, more and more we see communities, people that are disconnected from, you know, what the kids call IRL in real life. Um, and I think that's the challenge, right, is that we don't want people to sort of you know, go deep rabbit holing, and there's a lot of pernicious elements of AI, uh, you know, outlined in some great books like The Chaos Machine by Max Fisher, where he talks about how algorithmic, uh, you, know, you know, sort of bringing people down the rabbit hole um, and really sort of radicalizing people in these conspiracy theories can be hugely problematic. So, Double-edged sword, I think. Right, and 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 you and for you, I mean, your your company operates in a very specific geographical area, but there is a question from the audience in terms of companies' willingness to adopt your apprenticeship model. <laughs> Do you see any cultural differences between Europe, the UK, and the US in that? 
Definitely. I mean, it's interesting. If you look at America, America has an unhealthy addiction to college. Um, I mean, 70% of high school leavers will go and pursue a degree, nearly half drop out without ever completing, mm -hmm. right? The debt is astronomical yeah. and uh, frankly astonishing. Yeah. I think it is much harder, therefore, in America to establish this countercultural mm -hmm. idea of you don't have to go to college. Mm -hmm. There are genuine alternatives. And you know what? The best learning isn't done on an academic campus. People are going to have to constantly um, train and retrain. Doing that in an applied workplace environment is valuable. That message is, is landing, but it is definitely harder. I think in Britain, um, you know, back in 2017, the government instigated the apprenticeship levy to sort of encourage employers to at least investigate apprenticeships seriously. There's a regulatory framework for what an apprenticeship is, what minimum standards it has to adhere to. So there's just a greater cultural understanding. In Britain, actually plenty of Europe, Germany, France, mm -hmm. Austria, Switzerland, um, where they have had a robust technical alternative to the right. academic route. Yeah. So that you see quite clearly. Good. Um, th there's another question here, and I actually want to pose it to both of you. Um, how much of the workforce is going to need to have AI skills, yeah. broad term here, yeah. by 2025 yeah. in order to to get jobs and maintain them? Well, look, I think uh, professional jobs, however you define those, I think they're going to require some level of proficiency. Um, and BCG just did this really interesting, interesting study where they basically showed that sort of bottom performing individuals um, could sort of be leveled to the same level as top performing individuals by sort of proper training and usage of, uh, you know, of generative AI. Uh, so I do think that, like, I would say almost all will need some sort of basic proficiency in it. Although, again, that study was interesting because they showed that on the one hand, it helped generate ideas, but on the other hand, it didn't actually help solve business problems, which I thought was really interesting. So I think you know, good old human brain power is still quite critical. F fully agree with that. And, and, and having seen the report, and we did something similar with Burning Glass on this area. I think everyone will need some form of AI literacy. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that's something we've been focused on just because you, you can't afford to ignore it. And whether that's verifying outputs from generative AI, whether it's kind of some basic prompt engineering, or whether it's simply just understanding when to use AI and the consequences of doing so, yeah. that level of sort of functional capacity is gonna be really important. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance. I can't have a conversation about AI and the for workforce without mentioning the phrase universal basic <laughs> income. I mean, this is something that is thrown away around in elite AI circles as like the solution to all of the yeah. job displacement that AI will eventually um, bring about. Uh, where do you stand on I, universal? Look, I think we absolutely need a better social safety net, especially in the United States, hands down. I'm European, I'm half Italian, half English, so I'm for it. However, I think that a job provides purpose. It provides meaning. Uh, it's not just a paycheck. So I kind of don't think that the whole UBI effective altruism, you know, scenario is necessarily what I would go for. Just better social safety net. Yes, I, I'm likewise yeah. a, a skeptic for exactly that reason. Yeah. And when you think about the reason we focus on this kind of unlocking economic opportunity and jobs yeah. is a job is so much more than the paycheck. It's your status, Absolutely. your yeah. sense of well-being, yeah. what you can do. Sense of purpose. Right. And, and AI yeah. should make yeah. Your job more enjoyable because oh. you're not having to do a yeah. lot of the more boring Crappy clerical stuff. stuff. Right. And, and this is, this is I, I think, really important. So I, I don't think it's sort of a slam dunk for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we only have about a minute left, and I like ending these panel discussions with lightning rounds. So I'm just going <laughs> to go back and forth between the, the two of you. Don't even think, just answer. Uh, you in the last book you read. Uh, inverting the Pyramid. <laughs> um, All right. Jonathan Wilson, recommend it if you like football. I'll have Soccer. to add to the list. Uh, Frida, when will the AI take over the world? Uh, sometime when I'm still alive. Yikes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you and your favorite city to visit? Chicago. What? Love a bit of Ferris Bueller. All right. uh, Frida, the best meal you've had in London thus far? Uh, lunch at the conference. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> I've not it been here long. <laughs> um, oh, my. <laughs> yeah. You and uh, the year you seek a public listing. <laughs> uh, no, no idea. You're, the, just, you're, yeah. the, you're alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when I'm alive, hopefully. Uh, Frida, the, the, the biggest loser of generative AI. Uh, oi, uh, the biggest loser of generative AI. Um, boring stuff, hopefully. You and the biggest winner of generative AI. Anything where you're trying to turn 
scarcity and abundance yeah. into abundance. So healthcare, education, yeah. um, anything where there's a shortage and we can basically get this thing into more hands with AI. Good, good. And uh, let, let's end with the with the uh, the audience result of our polling question here. <laughs> we'll, I think that is basically what you both capped in this uh, conversation. Do you disagree? Yeah. Well, I actually no. think we've flipped it, right, yeah. in the sense that uh, most people are saying it will eliminate more jobs than it will create, and I actually think that could be true in the short term, but I think in the long term, it will be, it will be flipped. So, Fully agree, okay? yeah. right? Okay. Ultimately, more jobs. Yeah.